Good day, Lindsay. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Well, thank you. This is a delight. This is a world I haven't been part of for a long time. And your delightful reminder is some of the best of it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. I, I was I was thinking before as we were getting I was I was getting ready for this that you know, I, you were a mainstay at NSPI, the National Society for Performance Improvement, which is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. Uh, but you were a mainstay at the conferences that I started going to in 1980, and I went to 31 of the first 33 conferences after that. But but the, you kind of disappeared from the scene. I don't know. I was guessing it was the late 80s, early 90s. It's hard to remember, but but that I didn't see you for a long time. Now we're on Facebook together. So I'm kind of caught up a little bit with what you're doing, but uh, thank you so much for doing this. And I'd like to share your story uh, with our audience about, uh, you know, all things human performance technology wise and all that. But, but to get started, could you please introduce yourself? And we'll do this with a series of questions that I sent you in advance, but um, uh, so, Lindsay Robinson, you, where did you grow up? I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, in an area of Richmond that still considered it part of the Old South. Um, they had debutante parties. I did not make my debut because my father was dying that time. But, you know, that's the environment. I fled very quickly. As soon as I could, I went running away from that, went down to North Carolina, um, still part of the Southern stuff, to Duke University. And what did you study at Duke? I enrolled in electrical engineering. I was the only... Were you one of the few women in that program? I can imagine that's... that would that's. I was. I was. I was the only woman in my class. There actually, our year, were four... Um, women engineers, I think two in mechanical and one in civil, and me. Mm -hmm. so. Interesting. So what did, uh, what did you do after uh, graduating with your engineering degree? Well, I did job interviews, which was interesting. I, people don't talk about what a strange and interesting and squirrely process that can be, but it was. And I ended up accepting a job with TRW Systems to work on the Apollo program down in uh, outside of Houston, Texas. Um, and so I went down there. Um, I was working supposedly on... Um, Oh God, uh, analysis of the electrical circuits for the Luna module and the command module. And then I was there when we landed on the moon and I'll tell you that was worth all of it. That was a fabulous experience. Um, and then I was working, they started working on an airlock module that um, now is sort of back in the amoeba days of the space station. But I have to say, I, I hated it. I hated it. What the, was it that you hated? Well, there really wasn't anything to do. They were hiring people. And, you know, I was a new kid on the block. At Duke, they made us think we knew something. Of course, the engineers, when we get out in the field, just say, ha, ah, <laughs> you've just shown that you can learn. But um, I really... For so long, I didn't have anything to do. I'd go to my boss and say, what can I do? And he'd say, read this IBM manual. Well, I don't know about IBM manuals these days, but in those days, they were this thick and incomprehensible and not at all performance-based. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I was very unhappy there. So what did you do after that? How long were you there and, and where did you go to? Well, my timing was perfect because right after the moonshot, I got a job offer from the Applied Physics Lab in um, Maryland. And um, that was about the time the money started deflating out of the whole Apollo program, which was a real shame to let all that go. But, but I got out just before it hit. And so they 
actually hired me at a higher rate than most of the men I worked with because I turned down their first offer, mostly because it just didn't, wasn't convenient for me. And they came back with a higher offer and I took it. So what kind of work did you do there? there. Um, I was essentially programming. Um, I'd been working with um, Fortran and PO1 at TRW. And here we were working with um, um, IBM 360s and, um, well, once upon a time, I knew the name of that language, but I'm totally forgetting me. Over the course <laughs> of the two years I was there, I think I worked on about um, eight different computers and was doing um, PL1, that was it, Fortran PL1, assembler, machine, a little bit of basic and some other things like that. So, so breaking things down into small logical bits and making them work together was in my blood by that time. Mm -hmm. so, so when I got into, into um, human performance technology, then doing, for example, a task analysis was a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, how did you go from engineering and getting out of engineering? What, what jobs or experiences did you have? Because you ended up eventually working for Joe Harless, the Harless Performance Guild. So wh how, how did you get there? What was that journey? Well, you know, the first thing was that I was, I didn't realize how miserable I was at work except I was bursting into tears over inconsequential things. And I was thinking, wait a minute. And so I went to a therapist and he said, by the way, you're unhappy at your job. And, you know, it was sort of unhappy at your job. Are you supposed to be happy at your job? Good heavens. <laughs> uh, he turned me on to somebody, a career development counselor, uh, Bernard Haldane, who's saved my life and in the course of working with Bernard I stumbled across this little training company that was doing a project for the military in troubleshooting electronics in programmed instruction of all things I don't know how many people out there remember program instruction but it would kind of kill you it was one step up from computer programming. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I liked it, you know, it was all home for me. And I knew electronics and I could write a coherent sentence. So they said they'd teach me the rest. And fortunately for me, I loved the people. I mean, as soon as I walked in and started talking to the people, um, a guy named Jim Lawrence, who was the head of the company, who was just a delight and really into media. He taught me a lot about um, the frames and what people look at and camera angles. And one of the people who would come in to teach us more was Donald Bullock. And uh, because one of my colleagues was his student at Catholic University in those days. Mm -hmm. and so from Donald, I kind of got to know the it's like standing next to the mother load as it's being discovered. <laughs> I remember him at NFPI conferences. He was in a wheelchair then. And he oh, was a proponent of Gilbert's behavior engineering model and doing job aids. And uh, I learned a, quite a bit from him. In fact, I, somebody else gave me a couple of manuals of his, several hundred pages long each, focused on job aids and his approach to instruction training, he was calling it. And, uh, um, but the fascinating guy. And uh, so, so those were, that was your early introduction to all of this, huh? program instruction and Donald Bullock. Yeah, I kind of got thrown into the midst of it all. And I, it was just, it was, you know what I loved about it, what really turned me on to the field and kept me in it for so long were the people and, and the technology, because I really, I'm, I'm a left brain kind of person. Um, but the people were very data-based. They cared what the data said. 
So they were in their way very logical. And they were also personally squirrely as hell. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. You know, that they could be funny and interested in the arts and have a wide range of interests, which was not true of the engineers I was used to, and, and still be really dedicated to making a difference. So where, how did you come across uh, NSPI, which uh, back then, what, what year was this? And was it the National Society for Programmed Instruction or the National Society for P uh, Performance and Instruction? National Society for Programmed Instruction. You okay. know, I think one of the problems we've had is we have no good name for ourselves. We, we did perfectly well with instructional technologists until the web people came in and took it over. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was a whole nother thing. Yeah, when management information systems decided they wanted to be uh, information technology, that took the IT tag away from us. And then all of a sudden we've been wandering in the wilderness trying to figure out, you know, are we instructional developers, which then became instructional designers or instructional systems developers and designers. And now it's learning experience uh, designers. Uh, but we've had trouble with, uh, with what to call that tune, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. what was, what was the early days of NSPI like then? Uh, what year was this that you, that you were joining them? Oh, let me see. Uh, Logos had gone, the company that I worked with in McDonald's through had gone belly up. Mm -hmm. um, they were doing, um, doing objectives and they would only get paid if the people met the objectives. And they were not all that good at staying at at keeping to the original. For example, in one of the projects, it, it was some guy was doing a real con job on us and saying, okay, I know that you said the contract is only for reading the scales, but you need to have people be identifying the scales, but you need to have people able to use them. And all of these project managers had said, yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, you're right. But they hadn't made them pay more money. So the company eventually went bankrupt. I took over that project and I brought it in for the first time within the budget of my estimate. But because um, I could sit there and tell the guy no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but what a noble thing to try and do. We will only get paid if, if your people accomplish the objectives, no matter what you do to screw it up. Mm. So anyway, I went out a bit as sort of a freelancer. And then I kind of wandered into um, Athena Corporation, which was Judy Springer's um, organization then. I forget how I connected with them. But they were in charge of the conference that year. And so they said, you will go to the conference. So I went down to the conference and, and you know, had a wonderful time and um, was there ever since, I guess, I guess I sort of didn't stop going to conferences a little bit when I moved from Virginia out to um, New Mexico. And that's where you are right now, right? In, in uh, New Mexico? Lovely Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what, uh, working on the Apollo program, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so, but in your career, what, what uh, in your long career after that, I mean, you eventually got to work with the Harless group, uh, Performance Guild. And what kinds of projects did you work on with them or with, with others that uh, back in their early days? And I, and I had to, undertake a strategy of practically sitting on their doorstep to get that job, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was literally coming in to have lunch with one of the people there when I think it was Stephanie looked up and said, you know, we need somebody to, oh, there's Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Jackson. That, yes. that got me in the door. I'd done, I'd done work with Joe on conference before. 
Okay. So he knew that I could deliver. But, um, oh, now, and you asked me a question. I've now totally forgotten what your question was. I got off onto my own memory trip. Well, I would, no, that's okay. I, I wanted to know about some of the early projects. So, you know, what are some of the, you know, interesting projects that you've worked on? Because, you know, some projects are kind of mundane and, you know, but the others are really kind of very interesting. And so what, what kinds of ex interesting experiences did you have in your work projects? Well, actually, one of the ones that um, got me into the door um, I think Claude, I don't know if Claude was in charge of the conference, but he was in charge of something at the conference. Okay, Claude Lineberry. Had, yes, Claude Lineberry. Somebody had dropped the ball and hadn't done anything with it. And he said to me, I was a freelancer, he said, if you do this for me and bring it off, then you, I'll get you to do this audiovisual uh, training project for me and so yeah you know and I must admit that project was a lot of fun because it's one of the things where they're bringing in somebody to train people but it turned out the real problem was they would get people trained it was a high security um, uh, security company where they couldn't let people in until they'd already jumped through a lot of hoops and been trained but then the people would come in to this room where you had alarms and everything else going off and all of this stuff going on with periods of boredom in between and then all hell breaking loose and the people would freak and leave after they had trained them. So I think they initially kind of wanted me to teach them something and I took a look at that and said, no, that's not what we're gonna do. So I designed an audio visual slide tape of all things that simulated the environment people would have in the work. And, um, and it worked. It, um, they said it really helped that they would bring people in to look at it and the people would go, I don't wanna walk there, which is exactly what they wanted them to say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I worked on the Apollo program and at the Applied Physics Laboratory, all the stuff was, it sounded so glamorous, but I really had no effect at all. And one of the things I loved about working for Logos and as an independent and then on this project for Claude's was it made a difference and we could see the difference. You know, we had data that showed there was a difference. Mm -hmm. And, and that warms my heart more. So that was one of the fun ones. Um, oh, Lord, there were some of them that were not so much fun, but some of the ones were, some of the things that were the most interesting about it <coughs> had to do more with learning about clients and client management. I know there was one project where um, I was doing a job aid. We had a, a project with the Bank of America and they were starting to put in several things that were going towards electronic banking. Um, and on one of them, <coughs> I had done a job aid. It was, I think on variable rate loans and when people should have a variable rate loan. And the more I found out about it, the more my answer would be never. <laughs> but I had to do a job aid on it and I did the job aid and sent it off to them. And I got a call about four o'clock in the evening, afternoon at work saying, this is horrible, this is awful. You've got to be out here. You've got to be out here tomorrow morning. First thing tomorrow morning. And so I said, oh, Lord, and I packed my bag and I got on the plane at the crack of dawn and was out in San Francisco, my eyes like this, and um, walked in. It was one word they objected to. <laughs> one word. And But for them, that was everything. You know, for me, looking at the structure underneath, it's like a word. I'll change the word. Okay. Yeah, um, it was that was that was harrowing. <laughs>
but um, clients are it like was that. That's educational. For sure. It was educational in terms of clients and things. So some of the things that were just fascinating about it, I can't think of a better way to learn the technology because Joe in those days was given, Joe Harless was giving mm -hmm. his workshops, which one of the few ways to learn what was going on. I mean, some people were teaching it in schools, but, but Joe and Gary were developing the technology as it went along. So, so um, they, they used their training materials to train me like ounce of analysis. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me a second. That was what I, I used. I think Stephanie Jackson was in charge of bringing me along. And um, she was wonderful. She's a very grounded person. And yet, I don't know if you've seen it in her, but she has a little mischievous glint she can get in her <laughs> eye. And so I really, I really appreciated her hand in tutoring me through that. Mm -hmm. So your first introduction to what I'm calling in this series, Human Performance Technology, HPT, which as you and I know, and for our audience, I would say that the name has changed and it's been many things since I got involved in this back in 1979. And so I was doing a video with Tiagi, I think back in 2009, and, and he said, he called it HPT and he said, well, what we used to call performance improvement. So there's been Many voices have been raised over the decades about, you know, what do you call this thing? Human performance technology, performance technology, performance improvement, um, you know, and all the gurus like a Gary Rumler, like a Joe Harless, like a Bob Baker, they all had their own names for these things. And I think that that's something that, that inhibited the society from latching on to something and then branding around that and, and communicating it with some sort of a uniformity over, over the years. Uh, the change we, got, we did done. also got kind of God crazy. I mean, we did kind of want to take over the world and have everybody and their brother come to us to resolve every issue because of course we were better than they were at making the distinction between cause and solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have been actually, but I don't know that the world appreciated uh, posturing that way. Yeah, there there was a bit a bit of that, I think. But uh, I don't know. When I came in, it was it was rather exciting because it was really all about data, and either you generated data that proved in or proved out your solution set. Um, I, it was something that I very much appreciated and, and being in the instructional design business and most of my efforts of 90% or more were all about instruction. And yet I got to play around with things that were non-instructional in nature and uh, uh, help clients, you know, improve their, their, their situation, their, their own performance or their own internal client's performance. But so what did you call it back in those early days? What was it called? Well, in the earliest days, you know, when, when I was hanging around with um, Donald Bullock and then early NSPI days um, with Tom Gilbert. And um, he called, I think Tom called it um, human engineering, mm -hmm. which of course appealed to me, but apparently the engineering was just a bit too much for a lot of people. Um, and people have always, from afar, had the idea that it would turn out robots, mm -hmm. and which isn't true at all. Although I must admit, I must admit, looking back at programmed instruction, I really have to. Um, I'll probably have to. Pay, I am paying comma for a lot of that, <laughs> for having done those horribly boring step-by-step, step, inch by inch programs. People learned, but it killed your soul. <laughs> yeah. I remember the arguments 
several arguments from back in those early days, at least, and, and I think they were already settled mostly by the time I got involved, but short frame versus long frame, that was oh. the deal. And how many M's in, in, in program, uh, pr programming or programmers, um, one M or two, uh, that, it was all kind of silly stuff, but, uh, but still the essence of it was to improve you know, results, what, uh, what uh, somebody later on, uh, uh, Jim McCampbell called measured results. And so I always very much appreciated, you know, that's what it was all about. You could feel good or better because you could see your improvement in the numbers, you know, whether you wanted a number to go up or down, you know, you knew which way you were trying to drive it. And then you could actually measure that before you started and afterwards and see if you had any kind of a measurable impact. The other thing I really appreciated about it <clears throat> was something I know Joe stressed was going to the people who are actually performing the job um, and asking them what was the, I remember saying to a client one time, you know, you're paying me an awful lot to go to your people and ask them what needs to be done. Why don't you ask them? And he laughed and he said, well, it's because people won't accept what they say unless it comes from an outsider. Well, that's, that's, that's somewhat true. Uh, that goes along with the joke, the old joke of, you know, what's a consultant? Well, that's somebody who borrows your watch to tell you what time it is. And yes. I, I, if you have a watch and you don't know what time it is, you may need somebody to tell you. Well, exactly. And that, and, and, I don't know, I, but th I think that's important. That's an important point you wrote, Royce, there was, you know, going to the people to talk to them, to understand, you know, the performance context and what the requirements were and how they were measured formally or informally um, and trying to demystify all of that. And, you know, what, 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 what had experienced people learned that could be shared with new people to help them climb the learning curve, the performance curve faster. Um, but yeah, that was something that, uh, that, that I learned from, I got an opportunity to work with Gary Rumler when I worked at, uh, was an employee at Motorola and I spent 18 months on uh, a dozen and more projects with him, small projects and big projects where I saw him in action. And, and it was what the quality movement calls the Gemba walk where you go out to the workplace and walk around and see what's going on and talk to people and make your observations and all of that. Um, rather than a lot of people sitting in some room someplace, just cranking out content, uh, a lot of guesswork, some research perhaps behind it. You know, in those days we didn't have Google and things like that. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have all those sources of information. So a lot of well-intended uh, efforts that were, you know, never going to work in the first place because of their methodology. Yeah. So who were some of your, so you mentioned uh, Donald Bullock, you've mentioned Judy Springer, and you've mentioned uh, Claude Lineberry and Joe Harless and then Gary Rumler. Stephanie. What were, and Stephanie Jackson. Uh, so what were some of the key learnings, you know, you learn from Joe the, to go and talk to the people. What are some of the other things and other people that you learn from, what can you share with us? Boy, a lot of it was learned by experience. I, Stephanie really helped me a whole lot. I remember <laughs> she once said, I think I was designing some instrument for gathering data. And she asked me what I was going to do with it. And I suddenly realized I didn't know. And Stephanie said, do not gather data that you don't know what you're going to do with it. What a simple concept, but you know, it's so easy to get in together, gather, gather, gather. Um, yeah. And, um, oh, of course, you know, then there was a whole other thing. All of that was very focused and very focused on identifying who you're talking to, identifying what it is you would like for them to be able to do, what it is they're doing now, what the difference is, why there's a difference, 
and what's causing the difference. And only if it's training, go in with a training solution. Um, and in training, it was such a novel idea when I got out and worked later with other companies. It was appallingly novel to them that when you're going to design training for somebody, it would really help if you figured out beforehand what it is they needed to be able to do at the end of training. And if you check to see if they could do it. Mm -hmm. Such a novel concept. When I later went to work for a while with the Department of Health out here in New Mexico, I was in a training department and um, I know they, they wanted me to do training on um, for supervisors in communications. Well, I don't know if you run into it, but that's one of the things that used to send us running for the door. You know, it was like, oh my God, who? Oh, all of them, what communications? Anything. Can I talk to the people and find out what's involved? No. Well, I did anyway, you know, and, and you know, I, I would have had ghost of Claude and everybody else on my shoulders if I had not done that. I, just to find somebody who's been in the job and not ask them what should be trained, but what were the situations you ran into and what did you do? What was the first step you did? What was the second step? And really, I mean, it's a task analysis, really, mm -hmm. on on those people just to find out what really worked and what didn't. Think of the people that who failed miserably. What did they do? Well, they ignored what everybody said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was it was quite an interesting experience going from the discipline that I learned from Claude and Joe and Stephanie. Um, and then landing into a place where I really was just a cog in the wheel and they wanted to say, I want a warm body to stand up and talk about communications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very frustrating. But that, and that's been true throughout the four decades that I've been in the business. There's people who focus on the topics or behaviors like communication behaviors, what Gilbert called the cult of behaviors, not knowing what the accomplishment was. Uh, or how to measure any of that, just, you know, try and change some behaviors as if that was always a good thing and, and weren't uh, situational appropriate behaviors that would vary in, uh, for any person in any job category. So who, who else what were some of your biggest influencers that you may have run across at the NSBI conferences or in work projects and that? Oh, well, <laughs> you know where I learned the most a lot? I, I learned a lot in the um, <coughs> sessions that I went to, the workshops mm -hmm. and the talks that I went to. I have to tell you, I learned as much from the late night parties. Yes. And I have to admit, in those days, we were a party crowd, a fairly heavy drinking crowd. And you'd get into this group with people and somebody would start talking about their experiences the project they worked on what they you know we were all sitting around with our drinks sort of holding up the walls but boy did I learn a lot about that I'm not sure I can pick out discrete things now but I remember when I would be working on the projects um, that they would keep coming up. I mean, one of the things is, you know, Joe talked about this nice linear thing of getting all this data together and the data in the front end analysis, get all the data together and it would point you to the solution. And so I did it by the book, exactly the way he said to do it. And what I got was 18 different solutions. That's unusual. And I remember somebody saying, you know, the best ideas I have are when I'm standing in the shower. <laughs> and that's true. I, you know, we didn't have any room in those days, except for lone voices like Judy Springer, to talk about the right brain and the intuitive part. 
Um, but I found that very important to know. And I found it, it very useful in some of the classes. I think there was a class I was sent to teach down in um, uh, Florida, in right near Disney World. Uh, and um, it was a class in how to use, what was it? It was a database system, how to use a database system. And um, the guy who was my primary contact had gone in and taught himself how to use it. Um, so he was kind of my technical expert. And of course, by this time, I'd been on so many different computer systems and so many different settings and so many different languages that it was easy for me to figure out. But what he was missing is what did people need to be able to do? So I grabbed a couple of people and found out, no, they didn't need to be able to do everything in the world. They've been sending them off to classes to do everything. And they didn't need that. Um, so sort of channeling Donald Bullock as it was, went out and talked to them and find out what it is they needed to do. They only needed to be able to put in this type of information and elicit this type of reports. Ah, much easier. But not all of the people were very left brain. Some of them were. And I did a bunch of job aids and I did a bunch of exercises for them. And I could get them together and just sort of start them and let them go. And then I remember particularly one lone guy who was much more intuitive and right brain. And he was just, you know, out of his mind about this. So I could sit with him and draw analogies and use a much more right brain approach in teaching him. And you know, he got to be one of the few people who stayed in that job and years later called me wanting me to design another class for him. I had to say, he, no, he wanted me to come teach the class. I had to say, you know, it's not quite that easy. And I give Judy Springer credit for that. Um, because she was the one who really opened me up to that side. I, I needed both. I needed the disciplined approach and the, um, huh, the results orientation and the, the, the linearity, but also to be aware of the value of being able to respond to nonlinearity mm -hmm. and to more intuitive approaches. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's one of the things that comes up for me when you ask it. Well, I, yeah, because I want to share with people, you know, who are some of the names? Uh, they may not be active anymore, but they had, uh, they shared lessons, they shared their insights in terms of how to improve performance. And, and that, that's part of my goal here is to, is to kind of capture some of my uh, interviewees' memories of people and things so I can point people to them. So that's kind of a segue into this next thing. So we talked a little bit about some of the people, um, but were there books or articles in particular that you can remember that you might want to point people to that are, you know, entering into the field and, and need to get a, you know, foundation established? Well, you know, some of the books that were around when I was there would sink a ship or put you to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you already knew a fair amount of it and had experience, they were fascinating because you could get nuggets out of it. But one of the ones I really liked was the one that, um, and I think they've done several since then, Erica Keeps and Harold Stolowich put together that uh, Telling Ain't Training. Yes. Telling Ain't Teaching, I think is. Well, the, yeah, there's, uh, there's Telling Ain't Training and there's three in the series, I think, but yeah, those are, those were fabulous books. You know, we almost, one of the things I remember was Joe gave a talk one time on jargon, jargon, jargon jingoism and jive. Um, and he was showing the distinction between them about how we needed jargon because if I sat there and told you 
all right, in order to do a job aid, we need to sit there and identify the target population and then we need to interview them and observe them in the field and what, you know, you just go, ah. Uh. Um, whereas we can use jargon like do a job aid and, and it covers all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I forget the jingoism, I think it was um, um, that everybody who comes into the field and wants to make their mark starts <laughs> puts puts a new spin on something and gives it a new name. And so and true today. Jive, no. was, Jive was just the people who were well talking out of their hat. But <laughs> yeah. one of the things I remember in listening to that is we did tend to overcomplicate things a whole lot to make it really hard for somebody to get in. Um, in those days, now it may be much better now, <clears throat> but it was, well, you need to know this, but you need to know this, but you need to know this, but you need to know this. And I mean, you really need to start with the elevator talk and then the first floor talk. And, the, and, and we weren't, at least in the days that I was acting, very good at that. I think Harold and Erica have done a fairly good job of that. I think Tiagi, I took several um, workshops with Tiagi. I think he's pretty good at that, sort of cutting through the confusion and going for the, the guts of it. Um, besides, he's a delightful person. He is. Well, Do you know he's a magician? Oh, yes. No, I, <laughs> I've been in many sessions with him. He's one of my favorite people uh, over all these decades here uh, in, the, in the business. He's a bit irreverent, and I like that. Uh, but he's uh, still, uh, he's, a, he's a solid uh, professional practitioner. He just doesn't take himself too seriously, which throws people at times when they, uh, 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 but that's part of the squirrely nature of some of the people that, you know, you and I, I think, love. But yes. so you kind of introduced the, the elevator speech. So one of my questions for you is, what, you know, so when you describe this, this is to give others an example that they can adopt or adapt and as they figure out, how do I explain what it is I do? Um, a little aside, I don't know if you remember, but Claude Lineberry gave keynote speeches. He gave two of them, I don't know, maybe a decade apart where he got, he read a letter from his mama. Yes. And his, and his yes. mom, and these are, I've got these online on my website, but uh, uh, the write up of them afterwards, but the, uh, Basically, the whole premise of, of his keynote speech was, we can't explain to others what it is we do. And his mama was really confused. And it was hilarious because he was a very funny guy. But uh, so what is it that you use? What's your 30 second elevator speech on what it was that you used to do when you were in the business? Yes, good thing you said used to do. I'd get into what I do now. <laughs> Well, how did you explain being in this performance improvement uh, field? Gosh, I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I, well, one of the things is I designed training that could be proven to work. Short and sweet. Good. That's good. And it's directed to what people actually need, not just to what people in an ivory tower think they need. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'd have to tailor that a little if I was talking to the person in the ivory tower. <laughs> but that is the bottom line. I mean, that's really what we started from. You know, back in gay bofice days and the days with the army mm -hmm. and um, when they were developing equipment and they wanted to have um, get people up to speed on it and they were trying to develop the training and they were trying to figure out what the equipment did. And here you had the pilots, I guess it was, grabbing the, um, the job aids, the, the task analysis out of the designer's hands and using them as job aids. You know, what works? That's the yeah. bottom. Yeah, that's so true. Well, so let's shift gears here a little bit here. Uh, you are a lifelong learner and you've, uh, you've retired from uh, the formal profession of training and instruction and that. And uh, 
So what's your current focus in life and what are you, what are you doing and what are you learning? What can you share with us? Well, when I came out to New Mexico, I kind of landed in the middle of what I affectionately refer to as woo-woo land. Oh, yes. I remember, I think the first couple of months I was out here, I met a bunch of Gurdjieff followers and learned a little bit about what their whole focus was. I had um, my first one-on-one -on -one talk with a channeled entity. I met an astrologer who I'll swear had a past life as a Knight Templar and had a reading done. Um, I met someone else, uh, a, sh a shamanic healer who's now gone on to fame and fortune. Uh, um, um, I don't think he'd call himself a shaman anymore. He's a, uh, um, uh, anyway, doesn't matter. Um, I participated in Sweat Lodge, you know, got into all of these stuff that were about as far away from the left brain world I came from. Um, and that's really where I've been ever since. Although I did for a while work as a trainer, training developer and trainer for the state here at the Department of Health. Um, and I do give classes. Actually, I got so frustrated out here because all the new agers would be the healers would be putting out their things saying, I'm a healer. Why did not anybody come to you? Well, because you don't have a consistent phone number and you don't have a business card and nobody knows how to find you. <laughs> so I started doing a series of classes for new agers on how to do their own classes. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, that was an experience. Um, I had them do a task analysis well, actually a target population analysis by doing a meditation. Mm. <laughs> that was really strange sort of fight, but it worked and it made it, you know, it made a difference. They never thought about those things. And most of us in the business world couldn't adapt to their language enough to be able to explain in terms they could understand what was possible. So that, that was kind of fun and strange and interesting. And I still start my classes with, they're very loose, but objectives. I give a job aid. I follow the job aid. I ask them for feedback at the end. I have, I have an evaluation form that I have them send me back. So, oh, I am so imprinted with that. I can't get away from it. I think that's true for, for many of us. It's hard to fall off that wagon completely. But yeah. let me shift gears here a little bit to, to terminology. Um, uh, you spoke a little bit about that when you said, you know, the business people can't, you know, we can't relate to some of our audiences. Um, the language has been a hang up. And I remember Joe Harless back in 1985, because I've referred to this article that he wrote where he complained about our inconsistency of language and you can't really be a profession if you don't have a consistent vocabulary. Um, but so my question is, is there a performance improvement term or a phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel that, you know, it's, it's misused, it's misconstrued or, or what, but do you have a term or a phrase that you want to put your spin on? Well, I don't know that I have a spin to put on it. Um, there are two ideas that are my favorites and that I think make the biggest difference. And that is going to your target population to find out what current performance is and what desired performance is. Um, and the other is developmental testing. Um, and I know that falls by the wayside. I've had projects where they got crunched on money and they decided to drop the testing. Mm -hmm. 
and that is never good. Um, and I find developmental testing, I, I'm very selfish. I like it because it saves my ass. Yes. You know, I, I would stand up in front of people and be really embarrassed if I hadn't tried something out first. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've learned that some of the skills I learned through doing developmental testing, one of the things is to probe for people to tear something apart and zip my lip when they did, to mm -hmm. not be defensive about it. And it's hard. I, That's hard. I would, I would call my pilot testing efforts after developing content and doing an alpha test and a beta test with other people to make sure. And then when you test the whole thing, when it's all done, the first delivery or deployment of it is, is that test. I would tell my clients it's a full destructive test. We're going to try to break it. If it's breakable, let's break it now before you do it, you know, generally release it to everybody. Um, and I would always have a struggle and I'd have to tell my clients that I was working with their subject matter experts who all would want to be in the room when the pilot test was there. Oh. I would have to tell them, you can only be there if you're in the cry room. And nowadays, nobody knows what a cry room is. But I used to say, OK, after the war, after World War II, lots of you know women were had babies. And so in churches and movie theaters, they had cry rooms. So those, they could go in there with a crying baby. And the rest of the audience would not have to hear the crying baby and, and disturb their you know religious uh, program or, or the movie. And But if you SMEs, if you subject matter experts insist on being there, when we're asking for feedback in front of everybody so that everybody can key off of what so-and-so said, agree or disagree, you have to be quiet. You have to shut up. You have to be in that cry room. We don't want to hear you. And you are going to struggle with that because you're going to want to defend what you pr produced and why. But the goal here is to hear it all out. You know, don't react to it now. Maybe at the total end, when the dust is settled and it's all over with, then you can explain yourself, but not in the middle of this thing. Could you get them to do that? Could you get them to shut up? I, well, it was a struggle. And so what I would do in, in classroom training when we were pilot testing that is that I would announce that to the entire class and the subject matter experts sitting at the kids' table in the back. You know, there would always be a separate table. That's who those people are. You people going through the pilot session, you're either you're either experts yourself or you are the target audience. So we can measure learning with the target audience and determine whether or not our content was accurate, complete, and appropriate with the with the experts. The people who helped create it are in the back of the room and they are supposed to shut up and not say anything so they don't get defensive. And if they do get defensive, you are all free to stand up and call them on it. So I was trying to, you know, use a peer pressure and establish expectations that, you know, they're here, they're here to listen and learn, and they're probably going to want to get defensive. And we can't allow them to do that because that'll inhibit you guys in the front of the room from speaking your minds. And that's what we're here to do is to test this out and hear from you. Is it working? Is it not? Why or why not? Et cetera. And we don't need any explanations. And as, as, as I had typically develop parts of it, I said, and that goes for me too. So, <laughs> so that made it even worse for the people in the back of the room because, you know, if I said, I can't get defensive and call me on it if I do. <coughs> anyway, but yeah, I had to, I had testing to is so important. And pretend that I had not been the developer <clears throat> mm -hmm. and ask people to tear it apart. And yeah. I, boy, I have certainly found some subject matter experts come in and wreck a training by taking over. I remember mm -hmm. there was one who was supposed to be the trainer. We gave him a job aid um, and he waved it in the air and never referred to it. Mm -hmm. And then of course, none of the students referred to it. They would just always ask each other, they do, they try to do psychic readings, for God's sakes. They don't call it that, but that's what they're trying to do. What is it that this ought to be? Well, it doesn't yeah. work when you're working with a lot of those things. That's oh. so true. But development testing, I think that's important. That's one of the things I learned. I remember Bob Mager talking a lot about testing and testing and testing and testing. And 
uh, over testing just to make sure because you know if you're working on anything that's got any significance and a criticality to the organization if it's important then you really want to get it right and so it was very important not to exclude that step so i learned early on in my career to I, I broke pilot testing out of the development phase so to speak and made a big deal made it a separate phase a lot of attention on it um and so my clients would know that that's what we're that's why we're doing this analysis design and development so we can go pilot test this thing here and maybe we need to do more than one pilot test and you know why or why not why you want to do that and uh but the goal here is to really to really break it. Um, and that required that the client work with me to identify who good target audience members would be, who good experts would be, people who wouldn't just rip into something just to rip into it, but would rip into it for the for continuous improvement purposes. Yeah. Um, and be willing to listen to other people and entertain their thoughts about it as well rather than somebody who is, you know, a, a one-way street. But, um, but the other important thing you brought up there was, was going to the target audience and talking to them about, you know, what does current performance look like um, and what were the issues in all of that? Um, yeah, well, most of the time, you know, you'll have somebody say they need training because somebody has told them they need training and you go in and talk to them and they know perfectly well what to do. It's just that the, the powers that be are actually making it impossible for them to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe would talk about motivation, attitude and incentive. Mm -hmm. And um, that if you ask somebody to read a meter under a five watt light bulb, Nothing will, not all the training in the world will help them do that, nor will all the motivating, you know, yeah. you, you've got to go in and re-engineer the system. I think that those are some of the more valuable things that I learned as an instructional designer type that, that I'd always be looking to, to go out and to work with the people out there doing the job at a level of mastery um, to understand what their what they did and why they did it, and also what they saw of their peers, where the peers might be struggling, what were their secrets of success, et cetera, and what in the environment what were the environmental barriers that they had to work around? How did they avoid them? How did they uh, avoid them in the first place? What did they do if they couldn't avoid them? You know, what was their how did they recover? And yeah. those are always things I thought the new people needed to learn, maybe not right away, but at some point they needed to have those kinds of strategies and tactics. And that only comes from actually going out and, and understanding that target audience and the target performance that you're trying to work on. Um, and that's something that's was not, not everybody did that back in the late seventies and early eighties. And again, today, not everybody does that. It's a huge issue, I think. Yeah, and it's it's a problem. It's a, particularly today, they don't want to spend the time on analysis. I remember mm -hmm. Joe used to say, if you if they have to cut you down to a third of your project, spend that third doing analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you don't focus on what's needed, everything else is wasted. That I remember asking him about his book, An Ounce of Analysis. Uh, is worth a pound of objectives. And that was kind of a little slight dig at Bob Mager and Bob's focus on objectives. And I found out later on before Joe passed away that, that he and Bob Mager, when they were retired, talked every month. They were close <laughs> and buddies and they were in cahoots with each other. There's a famous story about when Joe was president of the society of NSPI, um, he had a speaker coming from Europe to do the keynote speech at the banquet. And, and it was all a ruse. Nobody was coming, but, but it was the guy's name was printed in the program and everything like that. And he said, well, so-and-so didn't show up. And so by the powers invested in me as being president, I'm going to, he pointed his finger up in the air and he walked around the room saying, I'm going to choose our keynote speaker. 
And everybody was scared to death that they were going to be picked. And he picked Bob Mager, who then acted very flustered and uh, went up there and gave a terrific keynote speech because he was in on it and knew he was going to be chosen to do that. And <laughs> but those two were, were these are the squirrely nature of some of the people that were in the yeah. city. They were a lot of fun. <laughs> I had an interesting talk with Bob one time. We were waiting for something at probably National Airport. And um, he was distressed because people would come up and want him to come talk somewhere. And um, he would say, okay, for $10,000. And they mm -hmm. go, yeah. And so he was saying to me, you know, they don't understand what I do and, and how his process was. Uh, first finding out about who the population was he was supposed to talk to. Do you remember Bob doing tea, your tea pop? Mm -hmm. Yes. He could get the sound, I can't. <laughs> Find out about the target population, find out about the environment and the issues. But not only that, once he developed it, he tested his speech no. again and again and again and again and revised it. Mm -hmm. No wonder he, he would charge 10000 It wasn't that he'd just stand up and words would fall out of his mouth. He practiced that over and over and over again. And it's been a lesson to me because... You know, you see these guys stand up and they're easy. And I would have thought, well, someday I'll get up so I can do this and golden words will fall from my mouth. No, no, it takes focus, analysis, preparation, and testing. He was a perfectionist. I worked with him. He had done, uh, in 1999, he did the what he called the perfect banquet speech. And it was recorded. And I asked him if I could get a copy of it and post it online because I was I was in the audience and it was a fabulous speech and very funny and very polished. And I edited it and he made me, I edited it seven times before he would accept it. So, but but that was the testing. He was he was a perfectionist. He wanted the slide to come in a little bit differently. And so we went back and forth and I invested quite a few hours on it. I'm, I'm very happy about that. But I got closer to him once he retired. I, I knew him for a long time, but I didn't really know him well. And maybe he knew my name, maybe he didn't. <laughs> After he retired, I got much closer to him and he used to send me copies of his books of fiction. And oh. uh, you know, he, he wrote quite a number of, of, of books of fiction. I probably have five or six of them on the bookshelf behind me. And, uh, and, in talking with him, or actually when I was talking with Joe Harless, Joe Harless wrote a book of fiction, Black Warrior's Curse, which is a fabulous, fabulous book. And I asked him about, you know, why why did he all of a sudden decide he wanted to write fiction? He goes, well, I wanted to show Bob Mager how it was done. So <laughs> those two were, were very close, but they would, would pick on each other. And that's, that's you know, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, that, that, uh, after the conference, at the end of the day, going to the bar after dinner was my favorite thing because that's where I would sit and listen to all these people talk, debate, get into fiery arguments, and then decide that it was semantics and that they kind of agreed with each other. But that was always fun to watch. And I remember telling people, hurry up, let's finish dinner so we can get back to the bar and because we want to get a good seat um because seating strategically was very important if you wanted to really hear some <laughs> of the softer asides that they would have but but that was always fun but now let me ask you a question sure okay i came along in the days where my favorite client was was the bell system before it was broken up mm -hmm. and because of its nature it could and did and was interested in funding nicely researched projects. I think there was a set of standards they were involved with coming up with. Yeah, Fred Wells uh, was part of uh, coming up with the, uh, that was at the Bell System Center for Technical Education in Lyle, Illinois. Ray, my business partner, Ray Svensson worked there. But Fred was instrumental in putting that together uh, on behalf of the uh, operating 
uh, companies. He led the operating companies in working with BSTE, the Bell System Center for Technical Education, in coming up with that. And it was like, I don't know, 20 linear feet of manuals yeah. were yeah. step-by-step guidance. And so that people who weren't schooled in this could actually follow a detailed process with all the right checkpoints and things in them, yeah. come up with stellar instruction. Um, and, and then in those days, I think Danny Langdon, I think it was at American College, I forget where he started this, but he did the Instructional Design Library. Yes. He'll have some parts of that, yeah. which was about the only place that I knew of where you could find out what these things were that were being developed. Yeah. In fact, I had an exchange on LinkedIn today. Somebody had said that they had seen Frank Widra's book on learner-controlled instruction. And I said, I had that book. I think I've given that book to Gary DePaul. And so I think the books may still be around. But but, uh, yeah, so uh, Danny had... was the editor, and I think there were either 20 or 30 books in that series. Yeah. Um, a I had maybe a dozen of those books in total over the, and those are the kind of books that would walk out of your office in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> They'd just be gone and you'd, you'd look yeah. for, you'd, you wouldn't know if it, if it disappeared yesterday or, you know, two years earlier. Um, well, they were short and pithy. Yeah. But now, so I have a question. Because mm-hmm. that was an environment in which companies would fund long projects that did a lot of analysis. They were interested in doing whatever it took to focus the training so that their people spent the minimal time necessary in training and came out the most effective possible. They were tired of these six-week classes and stuff. So they would fund that. But my understanding is the world has changed and that a lot of companies are not, or at least 10 years ago, were not interested. They wanted you to do it tomorrow. They didn't care yeah. about analysis. And things were changing so quickly that if you did a six-month project like we used to do, what you were teaching would have totally changed in that six months. So well, that, that, I think that's part of it, but I remember uh, Gary Rumler saying that if it wasn't for the military, the U.S. military, and for AT&T, that all of, that he and all of his peers, the, the Joe Harlesses, the Bob Akers, they would have all starved. They would have all gone out of business. They would have all had to do other things, but it was and these guys would would compete against each other for projects. And when somebody got the project, he would hire everybody else, not he or she. And yeah. and but there was there was a uh, a lot of that. And it was AT T being a monopoly in those days. Uh, you know, they they have expenses and they just build that in the rate base. And you know that's kind of how that worked. But but they were interested in in longer term. They had a longer vision of their their efforts that, and, and how long things should last. Uh, I remember Ray Svensson telling me that the old telephones that we used to use back in the day, you know, they were the government forced AT&T to uh, write them off over a 40 year period. So those phones had to last 40 years. They were engineered to last for 40 years. And then eventually when after the modified uh, final judgment and green and all of that broke up the bell system, all these phones were made more cheaply. And, you know, the joke used to be that you could drop a telephone, one of those old phones, out of your dorm room from the third floor and you'd go down and get it and plug it back in and it would work um, because they were just engineered to be like that. But so I think it's there are pockets where, you know, some research is being done, funded longer projects that where, where the experience can be learned from. And, but, you know, other than the U.S. military, I'm not aware of any major companies that are funding those kinds of things. Perhaps Google is doing those kinds of things. You know, they've studied management and what work is good for teamwork uh, and such. But, um, yeah, there's, but they were far and few between back in the old days and they're far and few between now. And everybody thinks that we were in such a hurry. But if I remember reading things back in the NSPI journal, 
back in from the 60s and 70s where they were talking about how things have sped up and we're in such a hurry nowadays. Well, maybe we're in a greater hurry today than we were back 30, 40 years ago, but everybody was pretty much always in a hurry and there wasn't a lot well, of time where people would just sit back unless it was critically important to get things right, like at NASA, you know, with, you know the consequences of not getting it right if they were severe enough then most organizations will work to really get it right. But we're almost in a throwaway economy with throwaway attitudes. And so, you know, how much instructional content that's been developed over the years has been redeveloped in the same company over and over and over and over again, because they don't have a good way to inventory it and track it and keep it up to date and all of that. It's yeah. And, and it's, it's a consumer society. Yes. You know, they, they want to consume training, not just use something that's there. I remember years ago, Gay Bofeich, who's an old name you may not have ever yes. read. Did you? Okay. Well, he's the founder of NSPI, but yes. He's the founder of NSPI. And he also was quite a con man. But the um, Gabe was um, had a wonderful class on how to use existing material that contradicts what you're trying to teach. And bottom line was you use the contradiction. You, you show how it doesn't and you use that to do the training. And I thought, wow, what an idea. But nowadays what I hear is the, the fast, I remember when I was doing some projects still and I was doing some work with operant um, uh, David and Jenny Schiff and um, I remember Jenny and I was sitting one time we were working on this project and we had our contacts and we had a plan and, and our subject matter experts next thing we know they've been reassigned to something else and I remember Jenny was saying that that was happening to an increasing number of projects that the organizations just didn't have the corporate memory or attention span to be able to go through and stay with a, well, I, I'd say an analysis driven, but it's really a, a long project. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen some things that I don't know a lot about um, that we're talking about doing doing everything quickly and on the slide. Uh, somebody, I forget who it was. Margo, maybe Margo, Margo. was talking for a while about um, uh, working with the marketing department to actually come up with the information needed so that you didn't have to do a lot of analysis. You developed the training materials along with the marketing developing the market and the engineering developing the products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, working in parallel, there are, those are efforts that uh, I had projects with General Dynamics back in the late 80s, early 90s, where the integrated product development, where you'd be working on, you know, a military aircraft, you'd be working on all the documentation and all the training simultaneously. Now there's, you know, because no one could wait for the product to be done and then you could start on the training. So you'd have to work in parallel with every, and then things that were subject to change, such as, you know, where is something going on an airplane because of balancing the weight on an airplane? Um, it, it's no longer over on the left wing, it's over on the right wing or it's in the fuselage. And, uh, and that just meant we had to have uh, a different approach uh, that would work more, you know, today it's called agile. Um, so we had to, but, but you can't put out a minimally uh, 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 valuable product um, and, and not get it right. You know, there's, there's some situations where if you didn't get it perfectly right, well, that was okay. It wasn't gonna be earth shattering or whatever. But there's other situations where you have to really, really get it right the first time. And that goes back to what's your methodology? What's your process? Did you do your developmental testing? Did you get it right in the first place? Because you went and talked to people in that workplace, in that context and understood, you know, what are they doing now? What do they need to change? You know, what is that delta? How are you going to 
you know, get them to change their behavior or their practices. Um, so I think that there are companies where they are willing to do it right. I, but I think that the, but this was true in the early eighties, I think. Um, so when I look at today's situation, I don't feel that it's that terrible. I mean, it's terrible, but it's no worse than it was 40, 30 years ago because there was a lot of fast and loose efforts to put together content. It was usually topic focused rather than task and output focused. Um, and the uh, people don't have good analysis practices and that led to analysis paralysis. And so a lot of people don't do a formal analysis because they don't know how to do it quickly and they don't really do a lot of formal design. They toss together PowerPoint presentations and yeah. that is training That's for learning. And uh, um, it's a challenge for people that are new to the field. But, but when I hear people complaining about this, these complaints resonate with me because there's a lot of complaints in the field today that I kind of laugh about now because I can look back and think that, well, Rumler and Harless and Mayer complained about this stuff in the eighties. So maybe it's just the human condition and, you know, the names have changed the jar, you know, we got jingoistic and jive going on um, along with our jargon, which is a moving target. And we, we, you know, a lot. So I think back to, job aids and before job aids rumler and gilbert were calling it guidance well today we call it performance support we call it workflow learning and we've got all these names for things that have a long history and before gilbert and rumler were calling it guidance the u.s military was doing stuff in the 1920s and 30s that is really that same stuff so but we, that's what makes it hard for new people to come in is to is to is to sort through all of that, to demystify all the language, all the various models, which are somewhat similar. Um, and, but if they focus on, you know, the terminal performance and how to measure that, and if they keep that top of mind, I think that they'll be better off because I think that, you know, when I came into the field, I learned from a lot of different people who all called it slightly different things. Their models were slightly different. Um, and I had to kind of navigate through all of that and figure that out to myself. And, uh, but I think that that helped me, you know, steal from the best, you know, uh, I think there's nothing that I've really done that probably isn't attributed to somebody else and something that I learned from them deliberately or in, uh, or, you know, inadvertently just accidentally. Um, you know, you go to a session, you see something, you hear something, you think about it, and two years later, you apply it. Well, I was thinking, you know, for me, since I was I was learning the technology in a fairly disciplined way mm -hmm. <clears throat> at a time that let us actually do projects by the book. Okay, now, like you and I were saying, we've internalized it. Yeah. I mean, you can drop me into a state government office that says stand up and teach about communication. And it's, I'm branded with things that mean I will go out and I will deliver a class that will be much better than it usually would be from somebody doing that. Mm. But to learn it from scratch now must be really hard. I guess the real bottom line is if you set your goal and you measure whether it worked, I guess everything else comes yeah. from that. I, I think that that's the, that's the truism. That's the North star from everything that was being, you know, whether you call it management by objectives or ocean planning and de policy deployment that what the Japanese call it out of the quality world, it was really being focused on, What's that terminal performance, that criterion referenced instructional kinds of thing? You know, it's about those objectives and where do they come from and, and how would we measure them and what's the baseline and what, you know, what, what effect did we have when we're, when all is said and done? Um, yeah, and so we don't have to argue about need. whether it's a criterion test item or an objective. It's just, did it work? Yeah, exactly. And, that, and do I know what work means? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Um, and will it, will it transfer out of the classroom or the, uh, the e-learning experience back to the job? And, and will people be actually be able to apply what they've learned? That's, yeah. That requires going back out to the field, talking to the people, understanding that context, what that real world is. And if you don't have that, you know, you're, you're only guessing and that's not going to be lead to good things. I have been looking at and suffering through some of the online training. Yes. Um, and and I must say, I'm impressed. What is, let's see, what's the one? I, there's something that if, oh, it, it's a, a safety class. Mm -hmm. It's put out um, by various and sundry modal, AAA probably is the one I've seen. And I remember one of them that I must have slept through. I mean, they had, Sue Markle would have choked on the size that they would give somebody, the step size that mm -hmm. they would give somebody before asking them to respond to it. Yeah. Um, and then you would have others that would do what she would call the copy frames, you know, like a stop, uh, a traffic light is red, blue, red, green, and yellow. <laughs> what is the one in the center, <laughs> you know, or something <laughs> like that. Um, but now I've noticed that they have gotten better. Their step size has gotten better. The responses they ask for are more performance oriented, not just mm -hmm. garbage resuscitation. And, and I'm glad of that, but I really agonized because, you know, the technology that they're now apparently discovering, the approaches they now existed 30 and 40 years ago. It's just, it was a whole different stream that they weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. or at least didn't make you so. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess. Well, and, and computer technology has made it easier to, you know, chunk things smaller and to reinforce it differently. You know, people don't have to go to a classroom anymore. They don't have to read a workbook. They can get, you know, dinged on their cell phone when, you know, it, 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 several times a week with uh, reminders and quizzes and things like that for to increase recall and and to strengthen memory. But so the computer technology is about all that's really changed. And I think that that helps people do their work in our business, in the instructional design business, for us to do our work and to deploy our work. And that's the huge advantages that, that exist nowadays. But there's that technology, which means the application of science and the science of learning and the science of instruction, the science of performance improvement, that that are that haven't changed very much. We may understand the mind a little bit better, and but but most of the things that are were true 40 years ago are pretty true today. And we just now have this computer technology to take advantage of and to help us do our jobs and to help our learners uh, access uh, instruction that will help them perform. But we are, we are opportunity rich. I think that there's, you know, there's the few out there that are doing really good work and there's many who are just um, doing their best. But, you know, a lot of that I think goes back to their management and what their management, the systems that their management have set up and their clients. And, you know, some people are struggling because they're in a bad system. And as Gary Rumler used to say, you put a good performer in a bad system and the system wins every time. Um, yeah. That's the challenge. Well, before we... I guess so, for me, the main thing sorry? Working, for me, one of the main things that made a difference was working under the people who knew. Yes. Even more than studying, it was actually working with the people who knew and hearing their casual conversation and how they approach things and the extent to which they um, had internalized the the whole approach that I'll call human performance technology for the lack mm -hmm. of a better term. <laughs> well, again, there's many terms here, but that's part of our confusion. But yeah, it's, but there are people that, you know, know what they're doing and they are out there and, you know, you can follow them online through various social media and, and learn from them. And there's many people out there that are very much like the NSPIers that I met early on who are so willing to share they may be a gruff personality like Joe Harless, because Joe Harless, 
you know, if you went up and asked him for anything, he'd say, you got any money? And then, you know, then after a minute or two, then he'd say, well, so what do you really want? And then he'd be very, very helpful, but he had to have that rough exterior to start with just as part of his persona. But, but um, I, I think that, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's good that people are more accessible through online technologies um, and there's a lot of, to be shared, but like in the old days, there's a lot of garbage out there and you've got to be wary of that and, and learn how to pick and choose. So it's really picking, you know, it's like your mom said, you know, be careful who you pick your friends. It's like who you're going to pick to be in your network. And are they, are they talking about, you know, evidence-based practices or what used to be called research-based practices? Um, but so, so is there, is there anybody else that you'd like to mention before we wrap up in, in terms of uh, people that we would point our audience to, people that are kind of new to the, to the field and uh, people that you learn from and, and or enjoyed that you would want to share with others? Oh, wow. You know, when you say that, I go back to people that, that you couldn't learn from now. Sue Markle. Phil but, but Sue's got articles and things that she's written that you can source on. But Sue Markle is a, yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the other thing about knowing the Markles and the Harlesses and the Lineberries is, is having a number of... Um, strategies in your bag of tricks it's one of the things i know that joe you know because he had this whole thing about how do you strat i'm not going to use that word i don't like it what strategy do you come up with for presenting the information whether it's a discrimination training problem or whether it's a linear back like jay alden's chaining um to have a number of those in your kit means you're not just hitting every problem with a screwdriver. Um, and that's one, one issue that I have seen is that people get to know how to do one thing and they're oh. going to apply that one thing by God, whether it fits or not, and then wonder why they fail a lot. Yeah. Um, and I would say that the trick to to gathering getting a repertory of things is hanging out with a variety of people it's one of the things the conferences were very helpful for mm -hmm. because you could go to different sessions and you could come away at least with ideas about different things to try in different situations i don't know if that's still true well, I think you can go to the face-to-face -face conferences and there's many online conferences. There's so many videos of people giving conference presentations in you know, North America and in Europe and really from around the world that there's many sources now to listen from so that you know, we, we're opportunity rich in that regard and that there's so much. Now it's just really sorting the wheat from the chaff and understanding who are good people who have you know, evidence-based, data-based kinds of practices and are willing to share them so that you can adopt them or adapt them. Um, that's, that's the trick, I think. And it's, it's maybe even harder today because if you went to an NSBI conference back in the 1980s, I've, I don't know, you could see you know, 20 sessions at the most, maybe 12. And and you're, you're kind of narrowed and focused in that regard. Nowadays, you can go watch hundreds of things and and you can't absorb them quickly enough and apply them and learn from them because you're just inundated with so much content so people you know need to be pointed to i think some of the the good resources the good people and resources that are out there and unfortunately you know claude lineberry wrote some things but he didn't write a whole lot and no, regardless no, that was mostly joe yeah Joe's uh, ounce of analysis book, he made me promise that I would stop anybody from ever republishing that. And, and I, he wouldn't give me a good answer as to why, because I had offered to get some graduate students together at some university, you know, I'd help coordinate this thing and, and have him update it. He wouldn't have to do any of the work, he could just talk to them, but he didn't want any part of that. And I never, never could get from him, you know, exactly why, but 
And then, well, you know, it just occurred to me from what you were saying about how you could only see so many presentations at a conference. Mm-hmm. That's why we ended up at the bar afterwards. <laughs> I think people you still would go to the bar snippets. regardless of how many they could go to, but, but, uh, you could get snippets from 10 different people. If you just cruised around enough and stayed around long enough and could remember the next day, what they said. <laughs> yeah. I think I took notes at some of those bar sessions, but then after that I stopped it because I felt conspicuous. <laughs> What'd you say again? Let me take that down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. This was a pleasure to connect with you face-to-face, even though it's virtual, uh, after all these years. Um, and we'll stay connected on Facebook and see each other uh, there. But uh, do you have any, any parting words of wisdom for our audience, people new to the field? What would your guidance be if you were to, to give them uh, uh, something to help them make the transition from outside the field into this world? What would that be? I would say one of the bottom lines would be when people ask you to do something, gently probe as to why. And what really is hurting that's asking, getting them to ask you to do it. Um, And the better you can hone in on those answers, the better you can respond. Good advice. Good advice. Well, again, Lindsay, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. And uh, 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 I wish you well, and I will see you out on social media. Well, thank you very much. This has been a delight. Bye now. Bye-bye.